So this video is really going to confuse people. Uh, the title alone should be confusing enough because I run a programming channel on YouTube. So why would I not call myself a programmer? Uh, this is a video I had planned. I uh, didn't know when I wanted to do it. And I had received some private messages. I'm not going to get into them in, uh, in any specific detail. I'll have a few quotes, but it's not going to be the majority of the message just by any means. Uh, I'm also not going to say who, um, because it's not important. Uh, I don't really have any type of rebuttal I want to say to the person that hasn't already been said. Uh, what I want to do, th it just got me thinking. Uh, about this video that I had planned and I decided to do it now using a few little quotes as uh, a build-up segue of sorts into in, into this discussion. So the other day I had started uh, when this conversation had started I had received a message that started roughly like this. Hi Patrick I hope this message reaches you well. I just discovered your IDA videos, and I think they're absolutely amazing. I would like to spread the knowledge of your videos in my network. Uh, maybe, maybe other people are naive, or maybe I'm just a cynical, bitter piece of human trash, but I get weirded out when people are very nice like that. That's just weird. It makes me uncomfortable. It feels like there's some type of ulterior motive going on. So I'm not rushing off like, yeah, this is amazing. Somebody likes my videos. It's weird. And the big thing that's weird is why would such a nice thing be said in a private message? as I kept reading. But, but, that's when it was like, yeah, here, here it comes. So you got the typical nice person. There's a catch. What's the catch this time? <clears throat> and I'm just running with it. I'm just running with it. I am just yeah and he says before I do that I kindly ask you to remove the rebuttal of Luke guest videos this this is, is not okay this needs to stop now this is cancer this this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back and it's weighing down heavy on me and it's not okay so let's get something straight somebody wants to promote my channel something that when i reach the eligibility requirements will be monetized and will be considered commercial activity in my country the United States has a law that dictates many commercial things, we, not to mention numerous regulations. We have the, the uh, UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, and <clears throat> numerous stuff that the FTC deals with, and, and tons of other smaller, smaller things. Because this is commercial activity, or will be commercial activity, Essentially, it is. I'm operating on a loss right now, and uh, but it's it's commercial activity uh, that makes this a commercial bribe, and I don't accept bribes. Where I'm from, that's a pretty disgraceful thing, and I will not have any part of that. You see, I believe very strongly in integrity. Even if I'm not a nice person, according to some people, I take integrity very seriously. So now it's very obvious why this originally nice message was a private message.
Then he goes on to say, Please consider that he has done a lot for the Ida community. You and him are on the same side in popularizing the Ida programming language. And no, we're, we're really not. Luke Guest, also known as Lucretia on GitHub, uh, has absolutely produced some great stuff. Do not get me wrong. The guy is not incompetent. Uh, maybe a little misinformed or cocky about certain things, but uh, the guy is not, by any means, incompetent. But us being on the same side of this, no. His YouTube channel can't find any instructionals on learning the basics of programming, learning the basics of ADA, learning moderate level stuff about either. Uh, he has some showcases that are definitely interesting and worth watching, but... Him and I very clearly, very plainly, have different goals. He's trying to advance IDA among programmers. I'm trying to get non-programmers into programming. Reducing a lot of the fears, doing a better job teaching this than is often done. Or at least I'm trying to. That is, uh, the, these are the goals I'm describing. Uh, I hope I'm accomplishing that, but... I hope I'm accomplishing that. But we're not. We're not on the same side of this. And something I pointed out to this fellow is that I have made videos correcting myself. In fact, uh, one of the ironic things about his statement uh, asking the videos, plural, taken down is I have a correction to something I had said that was absolutely incorrect. Nobody pressured me into it. It was literally just, hey, I was wrong. Here's how. This video was uploaded right after the first rebuttal and would be placed in between the two rebuttals I made to Luke. We're not always the most observant. Uh, I've definitely had some problems, but this video was plainly between the two rebuttals, and like I said, was immediately after, um, uploaded not even an hour after the uh, first rebuttal. It would be very difficult to look at the list of my videos and see the first rebuttal, but not see me correcting myself. So after pointing this out, he says, sorry, I didn't see it sooner. And I, I really have no problem with this. Like I said, it, it happens. Uh, I do find it a, a little unlikely, a little odd. The, the, the guy seems uh, rushed to form an opinion based on me. But I, I do understand this. This happens. And he says, as for the self-humiliating videos you've made, I haven't seen them. I just discovered your videos last night, and the ones I saw I really liked and were educational. I was just about to share the link to your videos when I saw your videos on Luke and I thought, why is Patrick making these videos? Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Yeah, that's lovely. Somebody you literally just found on the internet you're going to play armchair psychologist with. Know almost nothing about me, almost nothing about my motivations, credentials, past history, even personality. You see a videos list and you're confident enough to start playing armchair psychologist with my motivations. Believing these to be attack videos and not simply rebuttals on the code itself. But then also, he, he doesn't want anybody to dare post comments? 
I got a newsflash, guys. I am a YouTube channel with absolutely no comment filters. And if anybody's interested, I can absolutely... Actually, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll add it into this video. I, I will go into my YouTube settings and show that all the comment stuff, uh, any type of filter that they have, is turned off. Um... <laughs> I'm not into using those kinds of things. If you want to post trash, just be aware that people may respond to that in very unpleasant ways, but I'm not going to restrict what people can say on this channel. I have no problem with people commenting. At least, I don't know if it's where I grew up, who I grew up around or what, but we're all, so many of us were raised on this principle. Good in, good out. You treat people well, they will generally treat you well. I had some pretty authoritarian and condescending things said to me. I, it's not like I'm trying to do a pity party. I can totally take care of myself. I responded to them in kind. But if you're going to, to introduce yourself to somebody in that way, do not expect to get pleasantries back. I prefer things to be quite peaceful and cordial. I'm known for it at work, in fact. Because I treat people well from the get-go. But it should be obvious, I don't do nice. Kind? Sure. Helpful? Sure. I, I hope I am being helpful with the majority of these videos. But nice? I don't do nice. You criticize my code, be prepared to present something and have it potentially ripped apart, potentially I'm wrong, you're right. Good to know. The correction video that I did that same day. Two kind gentlemen pointed out that what I was observing and what I was saying was a deficient feature. Was a bug causing something that I wanted to have present not show up in that specific case. The bug had been resolved. I made some assessments that were not fair. Simple as that. Simple as that. Just kindly pointing out that it's a bug. We got this fixed. So in a later message, he goes and says this. Let me paint to a worst case scenario. When you apply for a developer job, the employer will do a background check and might come to the conclusion it's that guy that makes attack videos. Let's go with another candidate. This is obviously where it really got me, uh, got me thinking about doing this video. Uh, but also, when Luke applies for a developer job and the employer finds your videos, the employer might come to the conclusion, it's that incompetent guy. Let's go with another candidate. Oh, fuck yeah, this is the shit! Kill me now! Ugh. That's where... I'm almost ashamed to say it took me this long to realize what the guy was doing, because... I, uh... We're talking like six, seven messages in, and, uh... I'm normally a little quicker to pick up on these things. I'm being told how I should behave, how I should live my life, and without actually providing any evidence, it's just this, yet again, random person with authoritarian attitudes about how I am supposed to be. So I, I see what's going on here. 
that's what brings us to this point. I am not a programmer as I generally see them as they are seemingly generally perceived outside of programming fields. The comments managers have about them, the comments people who contract out to them have about them, the comments programmers have about other programmers. I, I, I do not fit into the circle. Now yes, given the strict definition of a programmer, I program. Therefore, I am a programmer. We all, for better or worse, we stereotype. I am saying that I do not comfortably fit into the stereotype of a programmer. I've nearly forgotten something. I, I was supposed to talk about this in a previous slide, so let me just go back to that. Um, we'll cover this one first. Quite frankly, if you are the type of employer, regardless of your field, who thinks it's appropriate to dictate to another person what they do in their time off work, Go fuck yourself. I do not understand how anyone can think they have the authority to tell another person what they are supposed to do in their own personal life. This is the kind of just abhorrent shit we see out of politicians on a regular basis, and for some reason certain bosses, managers, think it's appropriate to do this to their employees as well, as if they own their employees rather than if uh, there being some type of collaborative environment between the two. You might be saying I'm being a bit brash here. My opinion on this matter is quite easy to find. I've never hid any of these posts on Facebook or Twitter or anything else. I've had managers in the past who absolutely know I feel this way. And who even agree with me. Despite a lot of the trash I post all over the internet, I don't have problems getting jobs. I f actually fare considerably better than most of my peers. So, I really don't give a fuck. And as for this one, I'm not really sure why it's supposed to be okay for somebody to come to some random other person and begin to criticize things that do not actually have to do with what is essentially the job. Because that's what, that's how he's framing it here, that uh, we need to be concerned about the, how this reflects on employers in the workplace. So, keeping that framing, if I am one employee and he is another, and he came toward, to me and said these kinds of things. Granted, they're not particularly bad. They're not anything I would personally ever consider something like workplace harassment. They're just annoying. That's really not a good person to work with, though. I mean, yes, there's always these annoyances, but I think I am a firm believer in transparency in informed decisions, and that, of course, includes the personality of the person you're hiring, of the person you're working with. Just like with my own example here, I do not actually see anything wrong with this. There are all sorts of different people with different ideologies. Not everybody sees things the same way I do. There's plenty of C people that will see things the way Luke does. If a prospective employer sees the videos between us and agrees with Luke, disagrees with me, they're going to be more likely to hire Luke because they agree with his approach. They think he was the better person there. How are these videos then doing harm 
they're confirming that they're going the the business and Luke are going to get along better because you have a little window into how he handles things and if the business finds them agreeable and let's face it there's so many different people that there will be those businesses that's not causing harm that's helping identify better matches But I would expect nothing less from somebody who has to resort to bribery via private message. And if we skip back to where I was. Why I say I am not a programmer is that, unlike what I see from the majority of programmers, my attitude is just to solve problems and then get on with my life. Because working people, working class people, can't afford to waste time. You see, I grew up in the second poorest county of New York State, just barely wealthier than the Bronx. A lot of people struggling here. A lot of people, uh, not, not a whole lot of extra spending money, if you know what I mean. Often, not a lot of actual bill money. There usually wasn't a whole lot of time to fuck around. Jump from job to job. And by that, I don't mean, uh, you know, two months at one job, three months at another job. I mean, uh, a lot of people around here uh, work for themselves. Now, they might do this while uh, we're also working for somebody else, but a um, little more than half of the money... Uh, of the revenue in this county is uh, from self-employment and uh, or at least was last time I looked at the records it's like six years ago now but I doubt it's changed very much I uh I mean, it's not like we didn't enjoy ourselves. It's not like we didn't spend plenty of time with family and friends and everything, but work's taken very seriously here to the point where um, quite a lot of my friends growing up who left the country, le left the, the state, I mean, and traveled elsewhere uh, could land jobs on construction sites, in factories or whatever. Uh, literally just by naming where they're from, they'd be hired on the spot. Because... They got a reputation for this, and it's unfortunate that kind of reputation would have such a a uh, such a big poverty problem. But they're, they're, that's a delightful matter, not something for this. Uh, but I developed a tremendous amount of respect for these people. I look up to many of these people the the ones who really tried to make something of themselves and didn't fall to drug use and rampant partying blaming the system instead of actually trying to make something of their lives because you could absolutely make something of your life i i saw others did and i did myself but i I identify considerably stronger with these people than with academics. Actually, when I went off to college, it was one of the absolute worst experiences of my life. How bad I didn't fit in and how wrong my perceptions of things were, how little anybody cares about evidence and sh things like that. Because this, this shit, this is the kind of thing you see in white collar jobs, which I absolutely will not consider working class jobs. Now I say that having done them, I've done high end sales positions, I've done contract stuff for white collar programming things. It was considerably more about playing the field. You know, power politics, office politics, 
who you know. There's very little about the actual work. It's not working class as I've seen it. And that's a huge part of why I cannot identify myself as a programmer. Given that I also do carpentry, I sew, I non-ferrous metal work, I need to learn how to use an oxyacetylene and a welder and a TIG and MIG, but uh, I'm comfortable welding non-ferrous metals. Brazing is easy, soldering is easy, but yeah, carpentry, I, I did... I'll do some videos on that stuff, some useful things I've learned over the years that I don't see much people talking about, just like with the programming and sewing videos. Um, it's cold as fuck here. I've got a long winter ahead. Like, where I live is basically a frozen wasteland. My shop isn't very well heated. But when it's not deathly cold, you'll see some videos in the shop from me too. I I really identify myself better as some combination of tradesmen and salesmen. Programming to me is just a tool. Computers are just a tool as I see them. Writing code is the same as making, you know, rigging for your table saw to cut things a specific thing more efficiently. It's modification of a tool. I I don't share the same attitude other programmers have. Somebody implements a complex thing using, you know, I don't know, tons of monads and other shit like that. I don't care. The only thing I'm concerned with is, did you do the job efficiently? I don't care how fancy you made it. I don't care how many you know, computer science theories you utilized while doing it. It's how the job turned out. And I think that's the huge difference between working class and white collar. You should be able to tell I'm getting into a bit of differences and we should talk about that. This is sort of an easy target, but functional programming, it's great for math. And so understandably, a lot of very mathematics-oriented people get into functional programming and vice versa. Functional programming is appropriate for math. You see a lot of overlap. If you remember in school, the way math professors often explain things is really hard to grasp. You probably had to go in for tutoring or whatever to actually get it. And when somebody else would explain it, who's not a math major, would be like, oh, you explained it so simply and now I get it. I, um, I'll, I'll say real quick, I essentially started these videos because of an experience I had at Clarkson University. Now, I did not ever attend there. I, I uh, was working there, and quite a few students ha very, very obviously had problems in their computer science courses. They'd be asking things, and I happened over hear a few of them one day, and uh, just kindly explained what they were trying to get, very simply, as I understood it. They had aced those questions on the tests. I don't know. I heard from them like three weeks later, but uh, I don't know when the test was. But maybe that's just the soonest they actually ran into me again. But they... Um, pushed me a bit to see if I was willing to tutor them. And what wound up happening was actually to the extent of me leasing out I say leasing, uh, signing out in a, a little time slot. Uh, one of the lecture halls to tutor. One while eventually wound up being about 30, 30 students. 
<laughs> what was rather funny is the uh, the week long courses they had could usually be summarized in about thirty minutes, and they they'd go ace off the test. But you've seen some of the presentations. Uh, some of the other ones I either haven't done up yet, or I won't do up because they're not relevant or whatever. Or I've done through another means that seems to be better. That's basically why I'm doing this. That was my first real foray into uh, how bad we're teaching this stuff. And I have two quotes here from something that are going to make that really painfully obvious. The functor type class represents the mathematical functor, a mapping between categories in the context of category theory. And this is from the Haskell wiki. Now, Haskell is a great language, but being one of the most pure and developed functional programming languages, it goes really hardcore with the math-style description of things, and this is not so obvious on what the hell they're talking about. The... A functor is basically just a structure with a map method, map function associated with it. We're talking about a group of data that can have a function applied to it where that function will be applied to every single value within it, producing a new value. New, 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 um, well, yeah, each one of those will produce a new value and it'll be grouped up into another structure, container, whatever it was originally, just with the new values. That's it. That, like, what the hell are you talking about definition is literally just that. It's a structure with the map function. Monads in Haskell can be thought of as composable computation descriptions. The essence of a monad is thus separation of composition timeline from the composed computation's execution timeline, as well as the ability of computation to implicitly carry extra data. As pertaining to the computation itself, in addition to its one, hence the name, output that it will produce when run, or queried, or called upon. Now again, this is from the Haskell wiki. I'm not trying to bash Haskell in any way. It's, it's actually a great programming language. It, you want to do functional programming. It's uh, like absolutely pure functional programming. It's a, it's a great language to use. I've done some stuff in it. It's, it's a good language. I think they just have a serious teaching problem. A monad is a monad is essentially just a specific instance of the functor. It's a functor whose values inside of it represent the state and then just whatever is also getting passed through to perform the computation. Because you know in functional programming, especially something like Haskell where currying is involved, you have you know call from function to function to function to function and some data needs to be passed through those. So the monad is the state of the environment and then the computational data. And being a functor, it has a map function. A monad will also have what they call a flat map function, which um, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. It, it. Flat map and map are almost the same thing. There's a slight little little difference, but they're almost the same thing and i think i think at least for uh, explaining this it's enough to say that a monad is literally just a specific type of a functor uh, you know in pure programming languages 
you ideally don't want to have any state. If you even go to the extent of function level programming, um, there should be no values at all. And so monads are a way of keeping functional purity without violating the idea that you shouldn't have any state because the state is wrapped up into something that is essentially just a snapshot. Uh, actually, a great way of describing a mo uh, monad. Um, I built a bookcase recently. Unlike the typical bookcase where you'd cut um, dados through it, those little slots that you can you know, slide a shelf into and because they're little slots... It doesn't fall, it's supported. Instead of that, and gluing them in place and all, all, all that, I made a flat pack bookcase. Now, it's out of real wood, not that particle or bullshit, but um, it's flat pack. It's done with screws, you undo the screws, and the entire thing will lay flat for easy transport. Makes moving so much easier. At least for that, it's pretty simple. Plus, I built it, so I, I know how to do it. But uh, you know, if I were to make something like that for somebody else, and they were you know disassembling it, or like, all right, how to put this back together, you would hopefully, because at least it, it, for most people, it, it's uh, a highly effective way of doing it. Take pictures of the various steps as you're disassembling it, so that you can just do it in the opposite order and put it back together again. Those pictures are monads. That's it. Like, that's a monad. Is the state of something. That's it. I don't know what this is. This freaking definition. It took me forever to f figure out what a monad was. I'm not even kidding. I think it took me about three years to figure out what a monad was. Because I kept getting definitions that were equally as ridiculous as that. But a monad is just a snapshot of the state. That's it. So we all... Well, that's jarring. I forgot to put in a transition. So we also have uh, obsession with theory application. And this one drives me absolutely batty. It, it's where... And you'll hear this regularly out of me. A specific theory will explain one or you know, a cluster of things really well. Object orientation has absolutely great uses. Functional programming has absolutely great uses. Imperative programming has absolutely great uses. But there is no silver bullet. None of these should be applied unilaterally or universally. I think the reason why I am so averse to these things, and why I think... Uh, so much as in a, in a tool-based, uh, almost utilitarian way. What, what, what utility does, does each thing have? It's because of the large amount of trade experience and thinking in terms of getting the job done and not how do I write a paper on this. In carpentry, there's lots of ways to join things together. You can use a mortise and tenon or you can nail it together, or you can use uh, screws or bolts, or you can glue it together. Um, and you can cut a dovetail and join it that way. Each one of these, you can ask any carpenter, each one of these has unique benefits and detriments. They all have their favorite based on what they usually wind up making, how much effort they're willing to produ uh, put in, and, and all of that. But they'll regularly understand that each one of these has its benefits and detriments, that none of these are outright the best, just that they've got their one, they think, is... They've got their one they use most of the time based on what they make. A uh, house framer is not going to cut dovetails into all of the uh, all of the different joinery for a roof. 
a you know box maker picture framer they might absolutely do that the roof framer on the other hand probably going to use nails or bolts and there's reasons for these i think a lot of a lot of programmers just lose sight of this they they somehow think that they're uh the theory that is most descriptive of the their problem domain is right for everything and I can't identify with that. I can't agree with that. I don't think these things should be applied everywhere. But then I, I had somewhat commented on this before, the aversion of evidence-based advocacy. I don't know how many times I've heard shit like this, where using X theory, like using functional programming, results in less bugs in your code. But there's no source. Using object-oriented programming will result in less bugs in your code. But there's no source. Using the agile development model will result in less bugs and faster development time and tons of other things, but there's no primary source. Using X tool like like uh, JetBrains idea idea whatever whatever their IDE is called or Visual Studio or Get or Fossil will whatever will improve your development process with no citation of primary source. And from my experiences, programmers are all too often cultists with faith in their tools, development models, and programming theories. Not evidence in their approach. Faith in these things. Because I'm sure as hell not seeing much in terms of primary sources. I'm not even seeing much in secondary sources. It's overwhelmingly anecdotes. That's faith. Well, then we have code complexity finishing this up. And this just has to do with job security over any sense of reasonable code. This would be like your HVAC guy coming in and doing this insanely convoluted duct work so that you could get him to regularly come in again and everywhere I've ever seen would fire his ass and get another HVAC guy in there to do the duct work right in a sane way that can be maintained same for plumbing and electrical and everything else in programming People get away with it all the time, making their stuff obscure in various ways so that they can keep their job and not be replaced. Because let's face it, programmers are expensive and wage is one of the biggest places profits go. I get it. I'm just not okay with it. Because like I said, my focus is on getting the job done not on ensuring I have a continuing paycheck. I will find another job when I need to. I don't need to milk it for everything it's worth. And these types of people are often focused on a semblance of simplicity. Like I said, it's an easy target, but all too often monads are used as a simple way of implementing state within stateless programs. Simple to anyone who regularly uses them, maybe. But how they're simpler than a state machine is beyond me. You see, like I said earlier, there are tools for the job. There are theories that explain specific things well, but everything outside of their problem domain, terribly. If you have to work a lot with state, you should probably look into a state machine. 
Functional programming is great for functions. It is great for math. But being good for state is... Well, also, like I said, I'd like to see a primary source. Showing monads are a better approach to state than a state machine. And this wraps it up. I'm not a programmer. And I don't foresee myself ever identifying as one. I just see myself as a person who uses computers as a tool. No different than picking up a machinist's hammer. Dead blow hammer. A chisel. They're just tools. <laughs>